Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I have the pleasure of introducing to you uh, Professor Josef Indeke from the KU Leuven. Uh, Josef is a professor of theoretical physics <clears throat> and is working mainly in the area of statistical uh, physics and theoretical condensed metaphysics. And today he will speak about one of his favorite res research topics. Yeah? Uh, among other things, he's also the editor in chief of a very old journal, I think, Physica A, oh, has a long, long history, lots of good papers over the years. <clears throat> and he's at the moment uh, a visiting. Uh, visiting one of our colleagues in uh, in physics. Yeah. So Joseph, without any further ado, thank you very much for offering to give a talk. And please, you're welcome to start. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Welcome everybody to this uh, colloquium on uh, wetting and uh, non-wetting. And the work I'm going to present has been done in collaboration with Kanichiro Koga of Okayama University. And so let's uh, start this uh, fairly interactive colloquium. Where is this? You tell me. Where is this, Francesco? Where is this? Not far from here. Where exactly? Jongersuk, not quite. No. Go past Tokara, past the Lima, and take a right, kind of a small road, and you get to Oldenburg. Okay. So you see that in this particular place, some attention is drawn to an interface between two fluids. One is called wine, and the other is called air. We will be interested in this talk in situations of this type, where we have two or more fluids in equilibrium with one another, and the fluids meet at their mutual interfaces. Consider first two phases, as we had before, wine and air, and their interface. So the horizontal meniscus that we could see. We distinguish some quantities here, like an energy per unit volume. In this case, it's called a free energy density. And if we are above the so-called critical point of the two-phase equilibrium, where there is only one single homogeneous phase, then the minimum of this free energy density will describe the value of the free energy per unit volume of that single phase. It will have a density rho, which is corresponding to this minimum here. And its density or concentration profile will be uniform in space, in equilibrium. However, if we go into the two-phase equilibrium region, where the two phases are distinct, like the wine and the air were very distinct in the previous, uh, previous photograph, we can imagine that we have a free energy density with two minima, two equal minima, so that the free energy density in each one of those two coexisting phases has the same value. The densities are different, like the concentrations were very different in the previous photo. And we can consider the interface as a function of a coordinate in space, which in the previous photograph was a vertical direction, and here is chosen to be the horizontal direction. And so we go from density row A to density row B, from one phase into the other, and the planar or maybe curved surface that separates the two phases we can approximate by kind of a planar structure, and that's called the interface. It has very detailed microscopic structure, but in this talk, we'll be mostly concerned with a kind of more macroscopic approach, where uh, what you see is what you get. So you see 
an abrupt change from wine to air, and that we call the interface. Okay. Good. Now, I already mentioned uh, bulk critical points, which uh, could be reached if we apply a lot of pressure and if we heat up the system a lot, we might be able to reach bulk critical points. Now, if we talk about bulk critical points, we usually have one component in mind, could be carbon dioxide, for example, which at its critical point features the identity of the liquid and vapor-like phases that become one and the same single phase at the critical point of the fluid. And at lower temperature, lower pressure, these two phases become distinct and have an interface between them. Okay? So we look at the interface here. We go from a density A to a density B across a certain region in space, which is the interface and has a certain width. And the width in space could be maybe a few micrometers. We call this width psi psi for coherence length or interfacial width. Here is again the drawing of the bulk uh, free energy density, which uh, takes equal values in the two coexisting phases. And as we approach the bulk critical point where A and B become one and the same density, the density difference, not surprisingly, will go to zero. Surprisingly, probably, is that the width of the interface will diverge. The interface becomes more and more fuzzy. Uh, this can be seen in experiments in binary liquid mixtures, and it's called critical opalescence. So this uh, coherence length becomes of the order of the wavelength of visible light. And then the uh, fluid appears milky. So the psi diverges when we approach the critical point. So what will then happen if we follow the energy per unit volume as a function of temperature from the two-phase region where the two phases have the same free energy per unit volume to up till the critical point? Or what happens when we come from the single phase region, go down to the critical point? What happens to the free energy per unit of volume? The free energy per unit of volume will have some background value, but on top of that, there will be a kind of what is called singular contribution. And that contribution has some very peculiar uh, properties, just like the correlation length had a peculiar property and the density difference also had a peculiar, peculiar property. The density difference vanishes as you approach the critical temperature in this case. So we go to the critical point. And the distance to the critical point will be measured by the temperature difference, for example, could also be pressure difference. And we see that this density difference goes to zero in this manner where beta is an exponent. And let's think of it as one half, for example. So this could be like a square root uh, singularity. This coherence length or the width of the interface diverges. So we will write minus nu, where nu is some positive number. Think of it as maybe one half. Okay, So this would then diverge, because this is then minus one half. And then the energy per unit volume has also its characteristic singular contribution close to the critical point, And it's a vanishing contribution. And it has an exponent 2 minus alpha, where alpha could be something like, think of 0 0.1, for example. So this exponent would be perhaps close to 2. So you would have something that vanishes like a parabola that is touching, touching an axis, okay? like a quadratic uh, vanishing. But now the interfacial tension is energy per unit area. Now, how do you make an energy per unit area if you have energy per unit volume? I'll give you 30 seconds. You tell me. 
you multiply by by a length scale. Is there an interesting length scale here that we could use for that purpose? So the energy per unit volume is vanishing. But the width of the interface is diverging. So there is a, some kind of competition going on. And the product of the two is going to be the interfacial tension. It's not clear a priori that that should go to zero. Because we multiply something that's going to zero with something that's going to infinity. But the thing that's going to zero wins here. And the interfacial tension does vanish at a critical point under normal circumstances. Okay? And so this is what's happening here. So you multiply, get this exponent. And for real fluids, or a whole class of real fluids, this exponent is not far from unity, actually 1.3, approximately, in experiments. So now we already know a lot about what happens near critical points in terms of bulk and interfacial phenomena, right? So now let's go to the to the um, our playground by excellence in this talk. It's three phases. Are you ready? Yeah, good. We have three fluid phases and they're mutual interfaces. And in real space, it could look some like something like this in an idealized geometry. So there is the alpha phase, the beta phase, and the gamma phase, and they meet at their mutual interfaces, which we approximate by planes that have microscopic structure, which we ignore here at this level of resolution. And they also can meet at a common line of contact, which is not surprisingly called the contact line. Okay. And so these three interfaces can meet there. It's, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. If they, if they do, there has to be some balance, mechanical balance of forces. Now, this is going to be interesting. So let's see. Um, the interfacial free energy is energy per unit of area. Okay. And that's force. Force, yeah, Newton, force per unit of what? Give you 20 seconds. So we have an energy per unit of area. And that's going to have to be something like a force per unit of. Volume is a candidate. Will, they, will this candidate win the election? It's, you know, having big volume doesn't mean you win the election, right? So. So what would it be? How about force per unit of length? Would that work? Because if we do force times the length, we get work, we get energy, okay? So then per length times length would be per area. You agree, right? So the length, the thin candidate, okay, wins the election here. And so force per unit of length is going to be force acting in this direction, or in this direction, or in that direction. So the interfacial tensions act as forces that pull on the contact line. Forces per unit of length that pull on the contact line. So a mechanical e equilibrium of forces in this uh, two-dimensional section okay, will describe this equilibrium state. And some conditions will have to be satisfied among interfacial tensions in order for this to be stable. Otherwise, the contact line will move. We'll have a, maybe some spreading state instead of a stable equilibrium. Now, if you decompose the forces 
into x and y coordinates perpendicular to the contact line, and you work a little bit with the algebra, you find that the force balance on this contact line can be described in virtual space by what is called the Neumann triangle. So the Neumann triangle is represented here, and I'm going to draw it on the, on the whiteboard here. So one side of it is going to be proportional in length to the interfacial tension, sigma alpha beta. Another side of it is going to be proportional in length to sigma beta gamma, the interfacial tension of the beta gamma interface. And the third side of it is proportional to sigma alpha gamma. So this construction follows from the force equilibrium on this contact line, follows from Newton's law. And this angle here is pi minus, and see alpha comes here and alpha comes also here. So alpha hat is the dihedral angle between this interface here where alpha meets beta and this interface here where alpha meets gamma. So this is the angle alpha hat and this angle in the Neumann triangle is pi minus alpha hat. And this is pi minus beta hat. And this is pi minus gamma hat. Okay. So let's get used a little bit to this triangle. And let's um, start asking some questions now. The question is, Will one of the phases be able to wet the interface between the other two, destroying the contact line, preventing pre-phase contact? Are we going to see that? And under which circumstances can we see that? Or conversely, under which circumstances can we have a genuine three-phase contact? So that is stable, where all three phases can be in mutual contact with one another. Okay, so that's the question, and the answer is well, it depends on what happens with the Neumann triangle, either in model calculations, which we will describe later, or in experiments, which we will also describe. And so basically, and now we can switch back to the, to the slides in full size. So basically, we're going to ask the question, what happens here to this inequality? It looks very innocent. It states that any side of a decent triangle should be less long than the sum of the other two sides. Okay. So for any decent triangle, we would have a strict inequality here. And since then, we would have the decent triangle, which describes the three-phase mechanical equilibrium. This means that we have a contact line and that we have, say, the three phases in mutual contact. So we call this non-wet. You could call it differently, you could call it partial wet or something else, but we just call it non-wet. So then what is then wet? Okay, wet is when we reach the equality. When you reach the equality, why would that why would that deserve to be called the wet state? Well, let's look, let's look in real space now. In real space, the three phases meet in this configuration. This is a, a view perpendicular to the contact line. Okay, no, wrong. This is a view along the contact line. So the contact line is coming out of the, out of the slide towards you, okay? And here, uh, this, this plane is perpendicular to the contact line, that's right. And so here are the three phases. And here are the three interfacial tensions, which act as forces that are pulling on the contact line. 
So this corresponds in virtual space to the Neumann triangle configuration. And here we see a configuration where the beta phase wets the interface between alpha and gamma, and there is no direct alpha-gamma contact anymore. And now my question to you is, when we go to the wet state, what happens to the Neumann triangle? I'll give you 30 seconds. So let's go back to our picture here. What happens to the Neumann triangle when we approach the wet state? when we undergo what is called the wetting transition. Yeah, tell me. It collapses. Perfect. So the Neumann triangle will collapse okay, to a line. And then we reach the equality. And that's wet. That's the wetting transition. From there on, if we would continue to change parameters like temperature, pressure, and so we would continue to stay in the wet state. We continue to stay in that wet state because any other, any other uh, attempt to force direct alpha gamma contact would then be unstable and beta would intrude. And that's called a spreading phenomenon. Okay, so you have the non wet state with contact angles that uh, are described by the Neumann triangle. But then we lose this, uh, these contact angles. Two of them become pi, one of them becomes zero. And uh, we go to the wet state. And we're sort of stuck in the wet state for a while. That's the idea. And this transition from these two, between these two regimes is called the wetting phase transition. Now, let's go to an experiment. So here's an experiment. So we have bottles here with liquids, and we have two phases that are liquid and one phase that is vapor. What, what is in these liquids? So liquids are mixtures of, in this case, methanol, cyclohexane, a bit of water, and a bit of dirt called dye in order to enhance the contrast between the two phases. And you see two different configurations. And there's lots of differences between these two pictures. But what is of interest now for us is what happens up here at the liquid vapor interface. And here in this cartoon, you see that there is what is called a wetting layer a thin wetting layer, because gravity doesn't like this, okay? A thin wetting layer of the heavier liquid. And here we see a lens, we see a droplet. Now this droplet is characterized by a contact line that is circular, and that's a contact line of the type we discussed. So the forces are in equilibrium there, and we have well-defined contact angles. In this case, uh, this particular contact angle between this line that I'm drawing with my laser and the horizontal line is the pertinent contact angle that the drop makes. Now, this is a nice drawing, and so you're asking me, uh, show, show me the real thing, okay? Okay. So this was composed one week ago in the Beers building here on campus. And I'll try to uh, try to show it to you. It's up here. Try to keep it still. Can you see? Can you see a drop suspended from the upper upper interface between liquid and vapor? Who can see the drop? Only you. So this drop, uh, maybe we should try to see this. Uh, 
slightly larger. So this drop is a drop of the heavier methanol rich phase that contains a dye. And it clearly has an articulate contact angle, articulate contact angle with the upper interface. Who can see that? Now everybody can see it. And this is a state which is the non-wet state. And the wet state I also have, and it's the same mixture, but with almost no water in it, whereas there was some amount of water in, in the one I showed before. So this is with almost no water in it. And this actually is not far from the critical point where the two liquid phases become one and the same phase. And so the interface is actually more wobbly interface between the two that's visible here. And there is no drop suspended there. And that's the uh, wet, that's the wet state. There is a very thin layer there that cannot be seen with the naked eye, but can be seen with ellipsometry. Okay. So Moldover and Kahn um, used this experiment to uh, draw a lot of attention to this beautiful phenomenon, which is the wetting phase transition that can be studied um, what was studied since 1977, um, very explicitly so, was also studied before, but um, by people who did not discover it, yeah, as one says. So here we can see the system once again on the left, and we can see in the middle some detailed pictures of the suspended droplet of the methanol rich phase from the liquid vapor interface for various water concentrations in the mixture. As we add more and more water, the cosine of the contact angle will go down and we reach also a regime where the contact angle is larger than 90 degrees, okay? Um, that's that's interesting, but what is interesting for us in this talk is the regime where we cross over from a finite, non-zero contact angle, but small, to a contact angle that is zero, strictly zero. And this is reached for water concentrations below a certain small amount in this, in this range here. And the cosine theta is equal to unity here in the wet regime. Okay. So I'm checking uh, the time with you. 20? Okay. Including questions. Good. Are there any online questions at the moment, Francesco? Good. Questions here? Okay. So the focus of the calculations that we did, uh, the model calculations, is to scrutinize the question of what will happen to the wet and the non-wet states as we approach the bulk critical point of the two-phase system that is in equilibrium with the third phase present. So we make two phases identical at a critical point, and then we ask whether one of the two phases that is becoming critical is going to wet the interface between the other critical phase and the non-critical phase that remains. But that's the question that we ask. Okay. And there is an interesting argument that has been made by John Kahn in 77. And this argument is so um, compelling that um, a lot of uh, research has been done to find uh, confirmation or exceptions to this kind of argument. So this is the game we're going to play now. Okay, We're going to try to guess what is going to happen and see whether it does or not. So the Kahn argument in some cover version that I'm giving you here says, OK, we have alpha, beta, and gamma phases. Now suppose that the gamma phase 
prefers contact with beta to contact with alpha. So that would mean that the interfacial tension between alpha and gamma is somewhat more expensive, is larger than the interfacial tension between beta and gamma. So this creates some kind of preference. But the question is, will that preference be enough to induce wetting? Or will it just induce small contact angles that, are, that still are non-zero? Okay. So when alpha and beta are near their common critical point, we know that the interfacial tension between alpha and beta goes to zero. Remember the exponent. What was the value of the exponent of the interfacial tension? It was close to which number? Yeah, close to unity, right? Yeah. The interfacial tension exponent, 1.3. That one. Good. So here is the real space picture where you see the interfaces and you see them as, as if they were forces that are pulling on the contact line. So larger force here, a somewhat smaller force here, and a very small force here. Under these circumstances that I've sketched, the gamma dihedral angle is almost 180 degrees already. And so we can approximate the balance of forces by this equation, which is called the Young-Laplace equation of 1805. And it says that the larger interfacial tension equals the somewhat smaller one plus the very small one times the cosine of the dihedral angle beta. Now, as we approach criticality, this, this gentleman here will vanish. And then the question is, how about the difference between these two? What is that going to do as we approach the critical point where alpha becomes identical to beta? What happens to this difference? What do you think? What could it do? We can check it later. We can check an experiment. We can check in model calculations. You have any, any proposal what it, what it would do? Alpha is becoming identical to beta. And we're talking about the alpha gamma and the beta gamma interfacial tension. So what will the difference do? What do you think? What do you propose? Yeah, go ahead. Say it. This one is vanishing, okay? And alpha phase is becoming identical to beta phase. And we're talking about their interfacial tension with, with gamma. So what do you propose for that difference? Go to zero, it goes to zero. It's a nice proposal. So now we're already here. Okay, this is just repetition of the previous uh, previous slide. So what's what, what's going on with this difference here? Kahn suggested, and that's his argument, that indeed this would go to zero, but would go to zero more slowly than the sigma alpha beta. And if that's the case. Then we're going to reach a point of force imbalance. Because this one's going to vanish, but the difference between this one and that one will not catch up with that small thing vanishing. And so there will be a winner here. And this will be unstable, and the contact line will run away. And when that happens, then the beta phase intrudes between alpha and gamma. That's what happens. When the contact line goes that way, then the beta phase has more and more intrusion space. Okay, so that's the calm argument for the necessity of wetting near a bulk critical point. One of the critical phases will wet the interface of the other critical phase against against some spectator phase. Spectator phase, a third one, or it could even be a solid wall. It could be something else, right? That's the Kahn argument. It can be checked in model calculations. It can be checked in experiments. Okay. 
we're going to check it in an amusing context. And I'll be very brief about this, of course. <clears throat> we're going to check it in three phase equilibria close to a point where all three phases become one and the same critical phase. And that's called a tricritical point. And it can be reached, it can be composed in experiments and in models, provided you have at least, at least three components present. Then you start to begin to have the possibility of a tricritical point. Now, this is interesting because if you have a tricritical point, and if you would go through this exercise, which we will skip because of uh, you know, running out of time a little bit, you can see that with three components, you still have some freedom to have criticalities. You can have what is called two critical endpoint lines. For example, a line of critical points where alpha, beta are identical, or a line of critical points where beta and gamma are identical. And the two lines will meet in the thermodynamic space at the tricritical point. And so you have lots of ways to check whether or not you get wetting. You have lots of uh, situations to check Kant's argument also, right? And so these situations are exploited in experiments, and these are experiments that um, use water, oil, and some amphiphile. Changing temperature at constant pressure, these experimentalists, and their names are Carl White and Busse, and this is an experiment of 1989, they were able to follow the configurations of lenses at the interface between what is called A phase and B phase here, lenses predominantly consisting of C phase. And they observed something very strange. They observed some instances of wetting, but they also observed instances where there's non-wetting, no matter how close you go to critical endpoints. And you remain with a finite contact angle. Now, I will not go through this because it's a little bit um, long, but they made an argument which is, is resembles Kahn's argument, but they started from the opposite, the opposite supposition, that the difference of interfacial tensions, alpha, beta, beta, gamma, okay, would vanish faster than the alpha, beta interfacial tension as you approach a critical point of alpha and beta. If that would be the case, then your Neumann triangle would become isosceles, close to the critical point of alpha and beta. And that would mean that your limiting contact angle would be 90 degrees, the neutral value. And you would not have wetting. Okay? And they also uh, had one argument that is exactly the Kahn argument, which they added in their discussion. So this is their Carl White and Busse argument, where the contact angle goes to 90 degrees, because the exponent of vanishing of this difference is greater than the exponent of the vanishing of the alpha beta interface tension. And here is the Kahn argument where it's the other way around. Now, start thinking now, so they distinguish case one. This exponent is greater than the interfacial tension exponent. Case two, which is the Kahn argument, this exponent is less than the interfacial tension exponent. And they concluded that their experimental observations are not consistent with case two, which is the Kahn argument case. They do not observe this. Question. Is the Carl White Busser conclusion that the contact angle approaches 90 degrees inescapable? What do you think? Under this assumption, it will approach 90 degrees. Under this assumption, it will go to zero or pi, 
depending on the labeling. Is it inescapable that the contact angle approaches 90 degrees, given that the experiment does not, is not consistent with, with the Kahn argument? You tell me. I see you smile. Yeah, go ahead. Hit it. What about what about the restrictions on action mu? Does somebody have a suggestion here? What happens when they're equal? They didn't discuss it at all. When they're equal, you can have any finite contact angle between zero and pi. And what happens in the Neumann triangle is that this side shrinks, and this side also shrinks to zero, but the angle there remains constant, becomes some limiting angle. <clears throat> now, in this experimental paper, they conclude that the limiting contact angle is 90 degrees, guided by their own variant of the Kahn argument, which actually is the converse argument. Now, in our model calculations, and this is the, the last thing I'm going to show you, in our model calculations, we have used uh, three phase equilibria. We have used a five-dimensional thermodynamic space, as, as is necessary. So pressure, temperature, and three chemical potentials for the three components. And we solve a two-density uh, functional theory exactly. And two densities is the minimum that you need to, to make sense at all in this, uh, in this context. And we project the three-phase coexistence region on the plane of two coordinates called S and T, which are linear combinations of pressure, temperature, and the three chemical potentials. So in, in a projection on this two-dimensional space, we can think of small t perhaps as a temperature-dominated variable, small s perhaps as a, one of the chemical potential-dominated variables, and the three-phase coexistence occurs between these two lines. So in this, in this region, there is three-phase coexistence. And one highly symmetric state is, for example, this one, where in real space, the configuration is this, alpha, beta, gamma, and the dihedral angles are all 120 degrees. Okay? So this is a highly symmetric point here that's, of course, of no special interest, but it, it is there. And then there are other, other points around here. And as you approach the critical endpoint lines, where here beta becomes identical to gamma, or here alpha becomes identical to beta, there is no wetting. There is no wetting. There is a finite limiting contact angle for the, um, for the two phases that become critical. When, then where is wetting? Where, where is, is there wetting at all? Yes. There's wetting very close to the tricritical point in this little uh, turquoise triangle here. And there is also wetting here and wetting there, but by different phase. This is wetting by gamma, wetting by alpha, and here is wetting by beta. And so what is happening in this model calculation is precisely the x equals mu business that you discovered there. The x equals mu. That's what's happening in this model calculation. And you can track the limiting contact angle as you approach one of the lines of critical endpoints, and you look at the asymptotic value of the contact angle just before the two phases uh, become, beta and gamma here, become identical. And the limiting contact angle will be called beta hat, and its cosine goes from the wet regime here, very close to the tricritical point, to any value continuously varying between 
unity and minus unity. And here we go into the regime where the uh, other phase, which is the gamma phase, wets the alpha beta interface. So in this entire range of, say, temperature, the asymptotic contact angle is anywhere between zero and pi. And the calculation reveals that the, the, non, the, the undiscussed case, x equals mu, in the calwhite busse experiment is what we see in the calculations in this model. Okay. So no critical point wetting in an entire gap, sort of a non-wetting gap in the phase diagram. So our result is consistent with the experiment of Calwhite and Busse, but Calwhite and Busse concluded from their scaling arguments, which are incomplete, they concluded that the delimiting contact angle in this entire range should be equal to, to 90 degrees, should be just that single value, the cosine equals zero, whereas we find it is a continuous curve. And so that's our main result. And just as an anecdote, I'm asking you this question here. Why did Calvert and Busson not discuss the case x equals mu? A, they excluded this case explicitly, but without further comment. B, they considered this coincidence physically unrealistic. Or C, they argued that a non-wetting state approaching a critical endpoint must attain the neutral contact angle value of 90 degrees. So who votes for A? Who votes for B? Who votes for C? So we have one person for A, three for B, and two for C. The answer is A. As simple as that. Okay. <laughs> so I have an incentive here for, for very skilled experimentalists like you all are. Please, let's do the experiment of Carl White and Busse again with this oil and water and amphiphile and observe the contact angles with greater precision. Thank you for your attention. Very much, Joseph. The exam will be tomorrow morning. <laughs> Are there other questions in preparation of the exam? Please, let's start with the audience and then we can ask also the people online if they have questions, please raise your hand. Yeah. Any question, comment? I think everybody's scared now. <laughs> Yeah, here, please. Thank you. So <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, with regards to the three phases, I would like to understand you have the alpha, the beta, and the gamma phase. And uh, I would, so you, you have the situations of the one wetting and the one not, but what if instead of amphiphile you have a micelle, which will forever promote uh, the situation where you have it going into between? Wait, you had the <laughs> sorry, you had the alpha, you had then you you end up with an alpha, a gamma, and a beta phase. So your gamma phase is a micelle phase. Um, yeah, how how would you model that then? Thank you. The experimentalists, and in particular Carl White and Busse, and you can check the paper for that uh, aspect, they were actually very surprised that they could find the non-spreading states, could find the lenses that uh, persisted arbitrarily closely to the critical endpoints. Because they were used to uh, situations where the amphiphilic phase is so good a surfactant that it will just uh, spread all over the interface between the other two phases, as you also expect from your question. How would you model this um, 
say, specific system, well, we have taken the point of view that uh, lots of systems can be described by, say, what is called universality classes, which means that uh, in spite of their molecular or microscopic differences in structure, composition, interactions, the predominant uh, wetting or non-wetting behavior should be governed by universal properties like values of exponents, of critical exponents, especially close to bulk criticality. So there are surface universality classes at or very near to bulk criticality that will uh, group systems in such a way that the properties will be shared by all the members of the group. This does not mean that specific model calculations uh, should be done that, uh, that include the subtle uh, microscopic, um, nanoscopic differences in, in interactions or properties, because these univers universality concepts are based on, say, scaling hypotheses or generalized homogeneous function hypotheses and should always be open to verification and falsification. And so, um, so your call is a very good one. It's not something that I would go for, but other, um, certainly other scientists want to do the more microscopic detailed calculation for specific systems just to, to check whether these more um, scaling ideas um, hold firm or not. Okay. There are no more no questions from our online participants. And if there are no more questions here, then Joseph, thank you very much again for a nice talk. It's been a pleasure. And, and according to plan, there should be some snacks.